<clears throat> as always, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be with you tonight as we go through the series on the book of Genesis, the first few chapters of the book. We found already in the last three sessions that it's all about, in the beginning, God. That is the touchstone for everything, because God is the one who either can miraculously bring this universe into being or methodically shape it into something that he describes as very good. And praise God, he does the same in your Christian life and mine today. We saw, especially in last week, that he's not only God in his power and ability, he is the Lord God, the ever-present, ever-existent, eternal one. And so he delights to do everything in detail for humankind, right up to the final touchstone, the pinnacle of that chapter, the marriage relationship. As we move into chapter three today, I know again, it's a huge chapter. There is so much here and I'm bound to miss different things. So please, in your private time, refer to the notes that have been sent out and just enjoy a step-by-step -step, um, devotion or study through this chapter. This, like every other chapter at the beginning of Genesis, is so foundational, so fundamental to our view of the world, or we often say our worldview, how we look at life, where we have come from, where we are going, why there are so many problems in our world today. Let's read together God's account of the entrance of sin, the first catastrophe in our world. Apologies due to time. I would just select certain verses tonight. Verse number one, the serpent was the most cunning or shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Verse four, you will not die, the serpent replied to the woman. Verse 5, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful, and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. Verse eight, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Verse 15, I will cause hostility between you and the woman, between your, sir, your seed and her seed. He will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. Verse 21, and the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. Then the Lord God said, look, man has become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out, take fruit from the tree of life and eat it, then they will live forever. So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden. And he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. After sending them out, the Lord God stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. 
Trust God will bless our meditation upon this passage tonight. I've already mentioned this is fundamental to how we look at our world today. I'm sure each one of us have come to a point in our lives when we've questioned why is there such evil in the world? Why is there suffering? Why is there chaos? Why is there death? And as we read this chapter together, God lays out clearly and in detail that every problem man faces in the world today comes from his disobedience and so the entrance of sin into this universe. I've mentioned it is the first catastrophe. God does everything beautiful in its time and suddenly Satan comes upon the scene to wreck everything that God has done. As you look at this passage, you're bound to ask the question, how did it happen? What were the consequences? Where was God in all of this? The initial answer, how did it happen, is very clear. Satan's deception leading to man's sin and rebellion. And that is always the case with chaos in our world today. What are the consequences? They are laid out here for us in the early chapters of Genesis. Here in chapter 3, we have two of them. Firstly, man is brought under Satan's slavery. Secondly, at the end of the chapter, he is banished from the presence of God. In chapter 4, he is shown to be under the reign of sin. In chapter 5, he's shown to be under the reign of death. And then in chapter 6 to 8, it's the judgment of God as the final consequence for sin. These are foundational chapters for us to understand our sinful condition before God and our total inability to do anything to save ourselves. How did it happen? We see initially here, but without taking time, as we step into the rest of Scripture, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, it's there in your notes. There was another rebellion. Before this rebellion, God created Satan. He's called Lucifer, son of the morning, the anointed cherub, the guardian angel. He was in the Garden of Eden. But his heart was lifted up with pride and he said, I will be like the Most High. And that pride resulted in him being cast out of heaven. And here he is in this universe bringing chaos, separation and death. Where was God in all of this? Oh, praise God, before sin or Satan ever existed. Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. He was chosen to be the Lamb of God, man's Redeemer, before the foundation of the world. You see, yes, there will be these five consequences, slavery to Satan, but Jesus Christ will come into this world to crush Satan at the cross and to set us free. Yes, man will be banished from the presence of God. But you see, Jesus Christ will enter into this world as the mediator. He will be banished at the cross for you and me to provide reconciliation for every fallen man and woman in this world. And yes, we will come under, we are under the reign of sin. But Jesus Christ stepped in as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world and bring to you and me his reign of grace. Praise God for that. You and I are under the reign of death. And he, the very source and author of life, will take upon humanity so that he can die. And by his dying, he will destroy our greatest enemy of death and offer eternal life to all who will come to him. 
Yes, there is judgment. But amazing truth, he, the judge of all, will willingly be judged for you and me at the cross and say to us from John 5, verse 24, truly, truly, I say unto you, he who hears my word, believes on him who sent me, has everlasting life and shall never come into judgment or condemnation. You see, this tyranny of Satan just magnifies before my eyes and yours the incredible power and ability and grace of the Lord God. He is still in control. And he is a God, if we will only allow him, he will take the worst of situations in this world and transform it into something that will be for honor, glory, and praise for all eternity. He is the Lord God. How blessed to know him today. Satan steps upon the scene of time. And here he is presented in his subtlety, in his cunning. The Lord Jesus describes him for us in John 8, 44. He is the father of lies. And he is a murderer. In Revelation Twice over in chapter 12 and chapter 20, one of the four names of his is he is the old serpent, referring us back to this time in the garden. He is evil, but he is the greatest actor this world has ever known. And you and I need to be careful today in this day of his grace, 2 Corinthians 11. Read it for yourself. He has the ability to transform himself into an angel of light. We need to be on our guard in our day also. As he steps into time, the very first recorded words of Satan are, first one we've read them, has God said? He always doubts the word of God. Secondly, that leads to a denial of the word of God. He says brazenly, you will not die. And then thirdly, it leads into two deceitful promises. He says, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God. Oh, dear friends today, we in our world are still so much under Satan's deception. We think our eyes have been opened by technology and development, not recognizing we're in the greatest spiritual blindness this world could ever know. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. You will be like God. Isn't that the claim of the New Age movement today? Satan is always trying to say what God has done is not enough. I can offer better. But they were originally made in the image and likeness of God. Satan is a deceiver. He is cunning. I did not read Eve's response, but I just want to draw a lesson there. Because Eve did not get the warning about the tree firsthand. And so she adds not only taking of it, but touching it. And I'm not condemning anyone here. I'm just drawing a basic lesson in our Christian life, don't get God's word secondhand. Make sure you study it. You hear the voice of God for yourself so you can establish your Christian life upon the foundation of God's revealed mind and will, his truth. Otherwise, you'll be swaying back and forth, the New Testament says, with every wind of doctrine. Get God's word for yourself. 
You see, here there is a process of temptation. And that's brought out for us in the New Testament, James 1, 14 and 15, having said, God can never tempt anyone. He lays out for us the typical four steps of temptation that you and I still face today. Firstly, there is the raising of the desire. And I can't take time to go in detail. Eve looks at it and the desire is raised. It's not sin at that point. Secondly, that leads to the most important or vital part of the process, the decision that takes place in the human mind. And typically for someone under the control of the sinful nature, they will allow, allow the raising of the desire to grow and develop in their mind so they get to the point, I want it. I'm going to do it. It's attractive to me. And there's only few people under the grace of God who say, no, it's wrong. But you need God's transforming power to get there. So typically that leads to the third step in the process, the act of sin. Because once you make the decision in the mind, it will always be outworked in your body. And lastly, that leads to the final thing, the result of death, separation from God. This is fundamental, important. We're in a world where we're bombarded by temptation every day. And I'll just point quickly to two clear examples. Joseph in Genesis 39 stands firm. You see, he's made the decision before the temptation comes. Because if you wait till the time of temptation to make your decision, I will often make the wrong decision. But you see, he purposed in his heart. He said, how can I commit this sin against God? When the wife of Potiphar came to him. But sadly, King David in 2 Samuel 11, he allowed the desire to grow in his mind that led to the act of sin. May the Lord preserve us. The process of temptation. First John 2 will tell you about the world system in verse 16. There is the last, the appealing of the eyes. Something that is attractive, something that is going to give you so-called wisdom. And this is what Eve sees before her. And so sadly, in her deception, she takes, she eats, and she gives to her husband. Now, before I run quickly to condemn Eve, can I just ask a simple question? Where was Adam? We've read at the end of verse 6, he was with her. That's interesting, isn't it? Adam, why are you so quiet through this process? Your wife is being tempted. You heard the clear command of God. You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you can go into various studies on that, which I don't have time to mention. But can I just make this point clear? As a couple, as a local body of Christians, we are there to support, to strengthen each other in the evil day. Don't just stand back and see your partner, see your brother or sister in Christ deceived by the enemy. You are there to stand in, sorry, to step in, to protect. And I appeal specifically to those of us who are husbands. Let's do everything in our marriage to found and protect our marriage on the written living word of God. That is fundamental. We're there to strengthen and support each other. What were the initial results of sin? We find them here presented in four ways. 
Number one, yes, their eyes were opened, but not in a way they wanted. Because number two, they realized they were naked and they felt ashamed. You see, sin will always make me feel unclean and bring shame into my life. But then thirdly, in their feeble human effort, they try to clothe themselves with leaves. And you see, human effort is always insufficient, especially in the eyes of God. My works and yours can do nothing to help us, to save us. And lastly, for the first time in their lives, they felt afraid and they tried to hide from the Lord God. What folly. Psalm 139 says, where can I flee from your presence? Hebrews 4 verse 13 he sees everything, everything is naked and open before him, the one to whom we will give account. You see, we can never hide. God sees, God knows every detail in our lives. It's very interesting in the New Testament. As you go through, and I'll just mention a couple of things from our notes here. At least on six occasions, Adam is held responsible. You may say Eve was deceived, but six times over, the New Testament points us to this reality. Romans 5 verse 12, he is the one who brought sin and death. Romans 5 14, Adam disobeyed the command. Romans 5, 15 to 18, four times over, Adam sinned. Romans 5, 19, he disobeyed. 1 Corinthians 15, 21, death came through a man, through Adam. And then verse 22, in Adam we all die. He is held responsible. Gentlemen, the position of being Responsible in the marriage relationship, the head is a fearful, awesome position. It means total accountability to God for everything in your relationship and mine. We are held accountable. Only once in the context of different roles in the church, 1 Timothy 2.14, are we reminded that Eve was deceived, not Adam. And it's presented in that context so that we learn the way to overcome Satan's deception. It says in verse 15, by living a life of faith, love, holiness, and modesty. One thing that strikes me in this passage, God comes in the cool of the day. And he says simply, where are you? Doesn't he know? Of course he knows. He's the Lord God. Nothing is hidden from him. But this is a loving, gracious question to bring them out, to give them an opportunity to admit and confess. So often, if someone does wrong in their life, I come with a sledgehammer and destroy them. That's not God. He comes gently and graciously. Where are you? Sadly here, as we still see in our world today, there's a lack of taking responsibility. And Adam immediately passes the blame to Eve. And she then passes the blame to the serpent. You see, we don't like to be held accountable. We don't like to own up. We love to point the finger to someone else. 
But if you and I are going to succeed or move on in Christian life, when I am wrong, I must admit I am wrong. Not try and pass the blame to somebody else. I am the problem. And I need to admit to that and own up to that. So that in God's grace, he can deal with me and allow me to move on in my Christian life. But here, we do not find that. There is the passing of the blame. How sad. God steps in. And I need to move quickly. Verse 14 to 19. He steps in in punishment. And each one involved receives their punishment. He says to the serpent, You are cursed more than all other animals. From now on, you will slither or crawl upon your belly. The whole of creation has been brought into slavery, Romans 8. But judgment particularly came upon the serpent. Secondly, for the woman. From now on, you're going to have pain in pregnancy and childbirth and how we sympathize with our sisters in the Lord. And you will come under the control of your husband. For the man, the ground is cursed because of you. And from here on, you will strive and struggle and sweat to survive. And then finally, your body will return to the dust of the ground. God steps in in righteous judgment. But against that background, in verse 21, God steps in in grace and he provides them with clothing. Where man fails, God will always succeed. And we assume it was an animal sacrifice. And from that, he clothes the man and the woman. And again, this points us forward to the coming of Christ and his salvation through his shed blood at the cross. He will able, be able to clothe us in his robes of righteousness. So we are just and righteous before him. But as I finish, I want to focus in on two key things here. We have seen two consequences of sin in this chapter. Satan's slavery and then banishment from the presence of God. When we think of Satan's slavery, do not be deceived. He is a horrible, wicked slave master. And in your effort and mine, we will never escape from his slavery. Ephesians 2 verse 2 says, he is the prince, the ruler of the power of the air or the unseen forces, and he enslaves those who disobey God. He is an awful slave master, tying us up in tyranny and fear, Hebrews 2, 14 and 50. So where is God in this? Oh, dear friends, tonight, right at that point of sin's entry, we find the very first prophecy of the cross in the whole of Scripture. And what an incredible revelation that is. God says to Satan in verse 14 and 15, you have used and abused and deceived this first woman. But it's through the seed of the woman that your head will be crushed. And God gives us a prophecy of that coming one, Jesus Christ. He will come into this world as Emmanuel through a virgin, the seed of the woman. And God will bless her and use her abundantly to bring total deliverance from Satan's slavery. To take us out of the kingdom of darkness and bring us into the kingdom of the son of his love. To take us away from the fear of Satan and death and to set us free completely. It's Christ. 
and the cross. And the amazing part again here is, in crushing Satan's head, his heel will be bruised. Christ willingly accepted the awful suffering and agony of Calvary, taking sin upon himself so that through his suffering, he would conquer and triumph over Satan. Luke 11, read it in your own time. It's verse 20, 21. He is stronger than the strong man. Colossians 2, 15, there at the cross, he made a public display of the spiritual forces and triumphed over them at the cross. Christ is victorious and supreme. And if there's anyone here tonight who's still enslaved, Christ says, if I set you free, you will be free completely. But then the second consequence is here, banishment from the presence of God. Not only is man unable to set himself free, he can never bring himself back to God again. You see, God drives man out of the garden that very same day. Because back in chapter 2, when he gives the warning about this tree, he says, when you take of it, or if you take of it, in that very day, you will surely die. And you may say to me, Adam lived to be 930 years. You're missing the point. On that very day, sin entered, they died spiritually. Death is separation. And man was separated from God, driven out of the garden. And later, finally, they will die physically when the body and soul will be separated. Can I just mention quickly here, I think we see the grace of God. God says man has become like one of us knowing good and evil. Perhaps he may take of the tree of life and live forever. How do we understand that? If man was allowed to remain in the garden and took of the tree of life, this is my simple understanding. He would put himself beyond the realm of redemption. He would remain forever in his lost, fallen state. And so in kindness, God drives the man out of the garden, makes it impossible for him to return because he establishes at the entrance mighty cherubim and a flaming sword. Death is the automatic result for you and I to try and get into the presence of God. Hebrews 12, last verse, is it verse 29? God is a consuming fire. And yet that speaks volumes to me tonight. Because Christ not only crushed Satan at the cross to free us from his slavery. He is the only mediator. And Jesus Christ willingly came into this world. Zechariah 13, verse 7, a wonderful prophet, wonderful prophecy. Strike the shepherd with the sword. And that very sword of divine justice there standing at the entrance to the garden was sheathed in the heart of Christ at the cross. And he took completely and satisfied and removed all God's righteous, holy anger for sin. It's gone. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 to 21. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Dear friends, you're not beyond the ability of God. Christ was there to reconcile fallen man. How did he do that? He was made sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He did it all at the cross. He alone is the reconciler. Two last quick references. First Timothy 2 verse 5. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. What a miracle. He's the man Christ Jesus. We know he's God and so he knows the heart of God and can represent the holiness of God. 
But to be your mediator and mine, he must become man to know our lost sinful condition. And so through his finished work at the cross, he can bring us back to God. Dear friend, tonight, it's not in a church, it's not anywhere else, it's only at the cross where a holy God can meet with a guilty sinner like you and me. He is the mediator. And lastly, he himself said those well-known words. John 14, verse 6, I am the way. You see, there is a new way. I am the truth. I am the light. No one comes to the Father except through me. Genesis is fundamental. May God help us to understand the importance of some of these things. Yes, Satan brought catastrophe. But it speaks to us of the wonderful power, grace and love of the ever-present Lord God, who has the answer to every need of mankind, even before this world was ever made. May God bless his word. Thank you. And apologies if I slightly over.